And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Today we're taking a look at Game of Thrones Oathbreaker. Hi, I'm Tom Vassell from the Dice Tower, and we're witnessing two phenomenons here. One, the extremely popular TV show, which as I record this is in the middle of its eighth and final season. And then of course, uh, the social deduction game, which many people know from things like Werewolf and Resistance, where you're trying to figure out who's bad and who's good. That's a good chunk of Game of Thrones, figuring out who the bad guys are. I have an answer for you, it's everyone. But in this game, there's someone's a king, and several people at the table are going to be loyal to the king, but most people are not. And the king and the loyal people are trying to figure out who is not. So it's kind of a back and forth game, but people also have their own personal agendas. Here's how it plays. You're going to play with the board for the number of players. Each board has two sides, and so you'll play five, six, seven, or eight players out there. Each player is going to, well, one person's going to be the king. So you're just the king. It doesn't matter about that. Everyone else is going to pick a character. So these various characters that you can pick throughout the course of the game, hey, they're all double-sided, so you can be many of the major characters from this story. Each character has a special ability that they can use once per turn. They'll be spending a certain number of cubes, doesn't matter the color, to do that. And they're also going to get a chip that matches their sigil that they'll be using over the course of the game. Players are also going to find out through secret cards whether they're a conspirator or a loyalist. There is usually more conspirators than there are loyalists, but these are shuffled dealt to everyone. And players are also going to get a secret goal. They need to have these certain amount of cubes at the end of the game or they won't win, period. So if you are prestigious, you need two honor and two power at the end of the game. You want your side to win by having your order be higher than chaos on this track. As the game goes on, these tokens are going to be moving up here. At the very end of the game, the king is going to guess who everybody is. If he's correct, white goes up three. If he's incorrect, chaos goes up three. As the game goes by, the king's also going to be, at certain points in the game, giving decrees out to people. He'll have a handful of decrees, and he'll give these decrees to a conspirator or a loyalist, at least that's what he thinks they are, if he's correct at the end of the game, that, that the, loyal, the loyalist, the ordered token will move up. If he's incorrect, the chaos token will move up, so he wants to make sure he's correct, but he can also do things to them and play cards like you can discard any other suspicion cards on this noble. You can pardon someone, or here, this noble can't talk for the next round, things like that. Now, players are going to be having a hand of influence card. These influence cards are going to be showing crown swords and ravens or chaos symbols. You can't show these cards to other people. Um, and the game begins. So you're going to be moving this track down here. So this means we're going to bring out two missions. So we bring out each of these missions. Missions show something I need to get finished. So both of these missions I brought out need swords. Although, let's put this one out. This one needs uh, crowns to succeed. If it succeeds, the order is going to go up one. If it fails, everyone who put a card here is going to get a coin and chaos goes up one. If this one succeeds, everybody who placed the hazard token here will get two honor and order will go up one. If it fails, chaos will go up by two. So going around the table, each player is going to pick where they're going to play cards. You can play cards at either or both. You have to play at least two cards. And then you put your chip down wherever you played the most cards. If you spread your cards out evenly, you can pick where you want your chip to be. Once everyone has done that, and by the way, you can talk about what you're doing and things like that, you then reveal all the cards that are there. So, for example, this says we need fighting. So this says on a fighting mission, it counts as fighting. If it's on anywhere else, it counts as a fail, but it is a fighting mission, so I have two fighting. I have a crow, which means nothing, and three chaos symbols. So there's basically a minus one. Chaos fails, this one fails, and so chaos goes up by two, and that's that. Now you're going to shuffle these cards down before they're revealed, so no one is quite sure who played what, although you do know how many cards people played to the various spots. After we're done uh, dealing with both of these missions, the king hands out a decree, we then bring out two more missions, and we keep doing this. The king hands out a couple of decrees, eventually and there's a few spots where there will be three missions that will be out on the table. At the end of the game, I've already mentioned, and players are going to hopefully have the cubes that they need by 
being on missions that succeed it. Um, and then hopefully your team will win. The king is on the loyalist side. And one side's going to win and the other will lose. And maybe not everybody on the winning side will win. So it's interesting if you're playing with an odd number of players. There's also an agent. You'll put a leftover card here that's not on the table, and it will just add order or chaos at the end of the game. The card quality for everything is very well done. These cards especially, they're nice matte cards, and they show various scenes from the series. In fact, they show scenes from almost every season, I think, except for maybe the newest season eight, because there's going to be spoilers on here, although at this point... I don't know that they're spoilers per se, but they show things, again, like I said, from all the different seasons. The character cards themselves, you know, they match the characters, um, giving them kind of uh, the iron price, a wedding plot, etc., the marriage pact, whatever it might be with an ability that matches that person to some degree. And then the these cards, the cards that the king can give out, there's a lot more artwork on them. They're all using stills from the movie, and they're okay. I mean, it's not fantastic. I think I'd rather have art, but it's very easy, and I didn't have any question what anything did. The chips themselves are very nicely done. I like them. The rules are very easy to figure out and understand, and there's a plastic insert in a box that holds everything. Oathbreaker is from Dire Wolf. They're the same folks who brought us the fantastic game Clank. Now, this game, there's a couple things we want to look at. First of all, does it bring the Game of Thrones theme to life? I have uh, to say that it, it does in theme, but of course, almost any social deduction game, if it were rethemed the Game of Thrones, would make sense. That's kind of the bread and butter of that universe. The artwork and everything, the characters, it's there, but let's say you're not a Game of Thrones fan. I think you could still enjoy this game very easily. You're just trying to figure out who's a traitor and who's not. And these characters, you might not know who Cersei is and who Tyrion is and, you know, all the different characters, but you can still get into the spirit of the game by saying that person's evil because you have no idea and because the character that they're playing, they might play Cersei and they might be loyal to the king and be good, which we all know is a lie in, in the show. But in this game, it very well might be true. The game itself is very similar to many other social deduction games where you are trying to figure out who the bad guys are. With a caveat here that there are more bad guys than not, or it's kind of even since I consider the king to be a good guy, although if you play the eight players, there's a king and a queen. Uh, there's two of them, uh, both you know, working together. So there's two good guys at the top. But it's, it's a unique game that there is that one person, and so there's three playing experiences. If you play as the king, you're sitting there watching everyone, trying to figure it out, and who you give cards to, huge deal. In fact, I go so far to say the king will win or lose the game. Now, everyone else is playing too. They're trying to persuade the king to make the right decisions. The loyalist is sitting there, and your job is fairly straightforward. You know you're loyal. You know the king's loyal. That's all you know. Who else is loyal? you got to figure it out. The conspirators, it's a much more difficult task because if the king can figure you out too quickly, he'll give you those cards and it will really rankle your points at the end of the game. As the game goes by, chaos will likely go faster than order. Order needs to catch up at the end by the king getting everybody right. Even at the end where the king guesses everyone, you can really, um, that's a six point swing, which in this game can be quite a bit. So the, the, it's like three different ways of playing. I have not yet played as the king. Looks fun. I played as a conspirator and as the uh, the loyalist. It's more fun to be the loyalist for me because I'm trying to figure it out. The conspirator, you're kind of sweating the whole time, which I know is the whole point of it, trying to figure out how to hide yourself and mess things over too because if the good guys work together, they only need to finish enough missions and the king can take care of you. So I like this game. I don't think it's the best in its genre. In fact, we did a top 10 social deduction games last week, and there's 10 games that are fantastic. But I would recommend it to people who like Game of Thrones and who are looking for something different. This has a kind of a, a various roles in the game where there's someone in charge and everyone is trying to work with that person. There's a few things I'm not a huge fan of. Not a big fan of the personal goals. I don't feel like they add anything to this game at all. It's like collect blue cubes. 
So as the game goes by, you try to go to a mission with blue cubes. It, I don't find that it has a huge emphasis on the end of the game. And it almost f felt like it was thrown in. And you want to spend cubes. Sometimes you use your special power, but you can't because of the color you need to collect at the end of the game. I don't know. That just that didn't sit as well with me as the rest of the game. It didn't turn me. It didn't make me dislike the game, but I just felt like I didn't care about that part of the game. The special abilities were really cool, and I liked trying to get my team to win. And so that's that part of the game. I thought elevated it. I liked the whole put a bunch of cards on something, mix them up, and see if it fails or succeeds. Certainly not new with this game. Many of the other social deduction games do it. But here it does work really well because you see the cards, and this is really the whole focus point of this game. What makes Oathbreaker different than other games in this genre is, like I said, the, the king and those cards that the king hands out. And whoever they give these cards to, they, they can give them special abilities or give them a weakness. But either way, kind of point out, I think this person is bad or good. So that does give this one person a more prominent position than everyone else, so keep that in mind too. Finally, communication in this game. The rules are very specific about what you can or can't say. There's a variant at the end where you can say even less. I would highly recommend that you can just say when you play a card down that this is helpful or not helpful. Otherwise, people will find too many ways and I think it's too easy for the loyalists to win. That's just me guessing. I think there's just too much information going around. The more obscure the information, it kind of balances out. So there you go. That's Game of Thrones Oathbreaker. Uh, this, this is a very hot topic right now. Everyone's wondering who's going to die, who's going to live in the new season. In this game, you can rewrite the stories any way you want. You'll have fun. It works with big groups. It is a minimum of five players, but can go up to eight. And that's kind of the best number for a social deduction game anyway. And certainly does things a little bit differently and it uh, adheres to the theme, which, as I said, Game of Thrones is like a social deduction game we're watching on TV. Dice Tower Judgment. Approved, 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 approved.